I'm here with Dr. Michael Dent from ID Tech X, who's just authored a report on genetic technologies in agriculture. Michael, welcome and thanks for your time. So firstly, Hi. how big is the market for genetic engineering for crops? Um, so the market, so, so we size the market at about $28 billion. Uh, and to be a bit more specific about what that actually means, uh, we t uh, we describe genetic technology as being anything to do with manipulating the DNA of crops in order to give some sort of benefit and taking the market for all crops that have had some sort of selective breeding or genetic engineering done to them at the moment, which is primarily just through selective breeding and transgenics or creation of genetically modified organisms. Uh, that is about $28 billion in the year 2020. Great. Thank you. And so I can see on this slide here, you've listed the different types of genetic engineering techniques. Can you run through what the differences are between these three categories you have? Sure. Um, so this is one of the images from the report, uh, so genetic technologies in agriculture, and it shows the spectrum of different technologies that scientists can use to improve crops. Uh, ranging from things like selective breeding and mutagenesis, which are techniques which have been done in one form or another for decades, if not centuries, uh, right the way through to genetic modification in, say, transgenesis and cisgenesis, which is things along the lines of creation of genetically modified organisms, which have been done quite widely throughout commercial agriculture since the 1990s, right the way through to genome editing, which is quite a new technology, which is only really just finding its feet um, in agricultural technology. So to start from the beginning, I suppose, uh, conventional breeding and selective breeding has been around for thousands of years and is essentially a way of improving crops by taking, taking, uh, taking specific organisms with desirable characteristics and breeding them together to try and create uh, offspring with the beneficial um, properties of both parent organisms. And this has been done for a long time. Uh, however, in more recent years, people have started doing things like uh, genomics and using techniques such as computational uh, computational techniques to try and figure out the exact best ways of breeding, uh, selective breeding organisms to try and get optimised crops as a way of, impro of improving the efficiency of the process. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, selective breeding is quite takes quite a long time to accomplish things and sometimes changes can be undone rather unpredictably. Mm. We then have things along the lines of mutagenesis uh, and protoplast fusion. Um, and mutagenesis is a technique where you essentially take a crop and expose it to something which is called a, a mutagen. So either UV light um, and high energy radiation or chemical mutagens, mutagens in order to hope that the DNA is altered or the crop is altered in a specific way to give a desired characteristic. Now, this is ran completely random, and also it's very rare that only one change happens to the DNA, so it can be quite time consuming. Uh, however, people have been doing this in agriculture since the since the late 1900s, and, and it is largely unregulated. Uh, we then get onto the more the more recent forms of genetic engineering. So this is things like genetic modification, where essentially you take a fragment of DNA out of one species and transplant it into another. And if these are part of the same species, it's called cisgenesis. And if it's part of different species, it's called transgenesis. Um, so perhaps the most famous example of this is the insecticidal proteins that are produced by the soil bacteria uh, Bacillus thuringiensis that have been inserted into um, corn and soy, among, among other crops, called B BT crops. And by taking this protein, which encodes for these insecticidal proteins, you can make corn or any crop um, produce proteins that are insecticidal and therefore resist pests. And then the final uh, bit of technology we talk about in this slide is genome editing, which is a much more recent uh, much more recent form of technology that people have been getting very excited about recently. Uh, and what genome editing does in a nutshell is essentially allows very precise changes to be made to an organism's native DNA, i.e. you're essentially just fixing the organism's DNA as it is rather than inserting any new DNA. And this is really interesting because it means you can do things like turn on or off specific genes that may, see, may be problematic or maybe you want to 
upregulated gene so it's on all the time and it's a way of, of creating benefits for crops uh, without having to go through the large expensive and difficult process of inserting genes from a different organism. So in your report you do a technical analysis of the some of the companies behind them and also a 10-year forecast so which one do you see <laughs> growing most over that period? So in terms of growth uh, genome I think I would say because um, essentially Genetic modification has been very has been very successful in the markets in which it's been applied. Uh, so things like in the US, where about 90, 99 percent of all corn and soy grown in the US is genetically engineered and, uh, through genetic modification. However, its uptake has been really quite stagnant, uh, partially because of very harsh regulations across much of the world, particularly in the EU, which make it almost impossible to get a new uh, genetically modified trait. Um, into a crop and be able to actually grow that in the field, uh, but also because it's just very expensive, requires a lot of time and a lot of money um, to the point where very few companies are actually able to successfully do it. Um, and the thing about selective breeding is it can be very successful, but again, it's very time consuming. And one of the really interesting things about genome editing technologies is they are theoretically far cheaper to do. Uh, and there are also positive signs from various regulatory bodies that uh, genome editing might escape some of the really harsh regulations that have uh, stimulated the progress of genetic modification. So going back, I guess, um, you know, over a few decades, GMO had a lot of press, you know, some some good, but a lot negative as well. Um, so what are the policy developments around uh, gene editing um, as a whole? Can you talk us through what, what you discovered when you when you did this research? Of course I can, and that is probably quite well illustrated by my next slide. So basically, the key difference between gene ed genome editing or uh, gene editing and the creation of GMOs in general is that gene editing is typically done on an organism's native DNA, meaning that no foreign DNA is inserted. Uh, and what this means is that these are often changes which could theoretically happen naturally. It's a form of mutagenesis in a sense. And because of they could happen naturally and it doesn't involve insertion of any foreign DNA, quite a few regulatory bodies around the world are considering this as effectively being an extension of selective breeding in a way, as in that because you're not inserting any foreign DNA, they're a lot less sceptical about it. And there are hopes that the public, who were very hostile in the 1990s towards GMOs, might also be more tolerant to genome editing, uh, particularly due to the fact that it's essentially tweaking the organism's own DNA rather than creating a frankenfood, as it were, by sticking in a bit of foreign DNA. And so what this slide shows is regulatory bodies around the world and the stances that they have expressed towards genome editing. So the USA is perhaps the most well-known example of this um, because the US Department of Agriculture have said in the past that they do not consider genome edited crops as requiring regulations. Um, now, this varies around the world and some, some countries have signaled a high degree of tolerance and some degrees, so some regions have, have um, signaled they will be just as, uh, just as restrictive towards gene edited crops as they will for genome uh, for genetically engineered ones um, so transgenic organisms so particularly the European Union which uh, says in 2018 that uh, all genome edited crops would be considered under GMO regulations now this in itself is quite problematic because from a practical point of view because genome editing results in changes which could theoretically happen naturally through selective breeding or indeed mutagenesis. It's essentially impossible to tell in a lab whether a crop has been genome edited, uh, as well as the fact that if the USA doesn't consider genome edited crops as regulated, that there will be no formal list of genome edited crops in the USA, which means that it'll be impossible for the anywhere in the EU to be able to tell whether um, crops grown in the USA are genome edited or not. Brilliant. Michael, thanks very much. I think to the viewers here for more information, take a look at the ID Tech X report, Genetic Technologies in Agriculture 2020 to 2030. Michael, thank you. Right, thank you for your time.